few technical issues this evening. Apologies. Um, let's have another go. This is Roy's first time on Instagram. He's more of a Twitter kind of guy. So thank you to everybody who tuned in. Welcome back. I'm really sorry about that. Let's start again. Okay, so I'm filling in for Matt Abbott tonight. This is the last um, in the series of Nymphs and Thugs Insta sessions. They have definitely saved the best to last. We're hoping that he's going to join us sometime soon. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about him while we're waiting for him again. So, tonight's guest is Bard from Linen Warehouse. Believes fiction is the lie through which we tell the truth. His work is dark, funny and scummy, balancing precariously on the thin line between love and fear. He's sold out shows all over the UK and featured on Jackie Abbott and Paul Heaton's number one album, Manchester Calling. He's been commissioned by the BBC to create new work for BBC Six Music and featured in local and national press. He's recently published his first collection, Algorithm Party, with Rough Trade and he's taken the literary world by an absolute storm. He is, of course, the mono-named enigma that is Roy where are you? There you go. Come on, Roy. Are you with us? Yes, Roy. I heard all that, giving me the fucking blame. <laughs> Good evening, Roy. You're looking snappy with your with your skinhead this evening. Mm -hmm. What it is, right? I've found a new cocktail. Right. Umbongo, Febreze and Methadone. <laughs> Delightful. How are you? How are you? And how are you enjoying the recently lifted restrictions? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm all right. Been for a bit. I've been for. I went indoors today to to eat some cake and have a cup of tea. Nice. Yeah, I thought I can't wait to do that, and then I did it, and it, it was just yeah, a little uh, bit, a little bit. Wellman. No, it was just one of them. <laughs> <laughs> right, for people watching who don't know, you grew up in Walton um, on the same street, I believe, for how many years? 25, in about five different houses. <laughs> couldn't get out of there. Yeah. Couldn't, yeah, couldn't get out, man. What was that like growing up in Walton? Fucking great. Yeah, it was brilliant. I mean, I wouldn't want to live there now, but you you don't know what you're in until you get out of it, do you? But I loved it. Yeah, that's true. And did you always want to write? How did how did that come about? When did you when did you first have an inkling that you might be any good at it for starters? And then how did it turn into something that went from being a hobby to, uh, to you know to where you're at now? Um. First question, when did I think I could do it? All right, about two years ago. Um, when did it turn from a hobby? Um, completely by accident, because what I used to do was just write two new pieces every time I had a Violet night, because that was my night, so I could, I could put myself on the bill. And that went on for a few years, so when somebody said, I had no intention of publishing a collection or bringing it out. Or, so, But someone, Nina from Rough Trade, said, do you fancy it? And I had all the stuff, so I just went, yeah, go on then. And that was it. Like There was no plan to ever get up on a stage or ever publish a book. Mm -hmm. Suits me fine, like, because I'm lazy and bone idle. I'd be making, making plans and shit, fucking hell. So, so for people who don't know, tell us about the stuff that you do with... Um, with Violet then? So you work as a promoter for Violet? Uh, not really a promoter, um, but kind of. We just we just provide a platform for artists and we wanted to do something different. Tuesday night, four acts, any anything goes really. Um, what we didn't want to do was do like, you know, token gestures. Sometimes people put spoken word acts on. And they just stick them at the bottom of the bill, or they go plus, or they go, or they put it on the poster in brackets, spoken word, like it has to be explained. We just put four acts on the bill, no explanation. They're on for half an hour each, there's no headline. 
to you, you might like it, and people did, and they kept coming back. I mean, it sells out every time. It's the fastest selling yeah. night ever. Yeah. Down really, the last lot of tickets I believe sold out in under five minutes. No, you. <laughs> yeah. Never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Oh fuck it, yeah, go on. <laughs> That's what I heard. I heard it. On Twitter. I heard it as well. Yeah, three minutes. So you've worked with bands, um, you know, as a storyteller, and also through Violet. Are there mm. any differences? Bands and spoken word people. Yeah, spoken word people. I'm fucking soft. I've learned. Bands are. Bands will pay for not. Uh, bands will play for free. Bands, yeah, they don't really um, value. Uh, this is just my experience. Musicians don't value themselves as much as spoken word people. When I ask a spoken word person, do they want to state in like, yes, yeah, sounds, my fee is two, three, four hundred quid. And I'm like, he's fucking right. Go on. Bands, sometimes, when they play, and I say to them, um, right, send us an invoice for this amount tomorrow morning and I'll pay you. And they go, what's an invoice? Some of them, like, they've, I say, how long have you been doing this? They go, oh, about six years. They've never been paid. Wow, that's it, so interesting. It, 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 it's shady promoters' fault. It's not their fault, but they've got to stand up for themselves a bit more. Oh, yeah, you definitely. And get a grip, man. Yeah, definitely. It, uh, Fucking earning some cash for what you're doing. Value yourselves a bit more. Listen to me. No, you're right. And also, the other thing is, we have to value ourselves on behalf of other performers as well, don't we? You know? Yeah, I think there seems to be some kind of like spoken word union where they've all just agreed, don't fucking play for free. Because if <laughs> does it, what I mean? Yeah, no, it's true. I'm from the Ralph Dartford and Jackie Wicks School of Professionalism where I just know right from the off not to perform for free. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I guess like an unofficial union. Since I've been doing this, and um, to be fair, not well, the only people who ever ask me to play for free are fucking Liverpool people. I'm just like, Nah, you know what I mean? Like big established kind of fucking night well, that's venues. The thing. That's the thing. If it's a charity thing or for a mate, then... Of course, yeah, of course. Completely different thing, but it tends to be the big organisations, doesn't it? Selling tickets for 10, 20, 30 quid and saying to me there's no money. Fuck yeah. off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you heard about this or anyone who was watching heard about this, but recently, I can't remember which supermarket was, but a very well-known supermarket... Um, were exposed for asking an artist to come and redecorate the whole of the interior of their cafe. Go on, just you know, for exposure. I don't know it. Well. I want to image it. And it. Go on, blow them up. I don't. I don't know. I don't want to say just in case I get it wrong. All right, then it was Tesco. Fuck it. <laughs> Let them have it. it All right, Tesco. Tesco. listen. We're not here to talk about supermarkets. Would you like to do us a story? No, i just talk about supermarkets for the next <laughs> but if you want. Fair enough, yeah. There's a boss one by me here called Ejoy Chinese. Oh, I know, I know Ejoy. I've been. I've bought, I've bought paper tofu from there. Yeah, it's got. you can go in and sit in. It's fucking great, man. Yeah, yeah. whatever happened to quick save? I don't know. It turned into the um, fucking... Oh, what was it called, man? That's gone as well. I don't know. Do you remember that bit in Quicksave? Did you ever used to go with your ma, like, when you were a Me kid? Dad. Kind of like a walk through Fridgey bit. Yeah, now you've said that. I do remember walking through it. And just yeah. remembering as a kid, just feeling so strange in that bit, how suddenly everything got cold. Strange. Well, the fridge, what, what, what do you <laughs> Yeah, but that, you... don't, that don't happen in other supermarkets, does it? Fair enough. L liquor saver as well on the way out. My man's eye used to buy fucking bottles of like Canada Dry and Bitter Lemon. Yeah. I, I didn't know that was an ale, but I'd taste it, you know what I mean, and think I was getting drunk and it wasn't, wasn't even ale. There you go. 
Jumbo bags of no frills crisps and all that. All right, Roy, give us a story then, please. Yeah. That's what the people want. All right. Um, but to nearly, you've waffled on for 15 minutes about little. 15 minutes? Oh, fuck, we'll be done soon then. Oh, fucking hell. Um, what, what am I reading? What is what, it? What are you reading? I, I don't know. Um, that one there. Oh, no. Yeah, okay. This story is called um, Points of View. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. Okay. Unusually, I'm at home today. The presence of a plumber has determined it so. I believe it's polite to offer a brew. I don't think I'll be turning my music down, though. No. He looks like a talker. Footy in that. Not for me, thanks. Sometimes, my anxiety won't allow silence when I'm in close proximity to a stranger. Maybe it will this, this time. The uncertainty of life, eh? There's just no blueprint that enables me to cope with such a calamity. Kettle's going on anyway. I'll change the bedding and search for the courage to inquire what Billy Blue Collar here would like to drink. Sliding one of my Egyptian goose-down pillows into its white company case, I wonder what he makes of the sounds of Aldous Harden that are currently floating through the airwaves. I glance at him. He looks like a Deacon Blue fan. I've got the kettle on here, mate. 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 Listen to me, one of the boys, mate. Oh, thanks. I'll have a tea, please. Have you got any soya milk? I've got some in the van if you haven't. <laughs> of course I've got soya milk. I was the only vegan in all sort, mate. I have, actually. Would you like sugar? Uh, spoonful of honey if you've got it. I've got manuka fucking honey here, mate. Yeah, sure, no problem, that. Cheers. Is this Aldous Harden? You'll really like Jessica Pratt if you're into this. I don't fucking remember asking a music critic to repair my sink. Yeah, I'll check her out. Fucking Pratt. The relative insignificance of his opinion is not lost on me. As I place the crockery onto the tray, I make the decision not to engage with this smart ass any further. Just get my u bend sorted, mate. I'll leave these here. Immediately, he's up from underneath the sink, leaping like a 2006 era Tim Kale at the back post. Oh, nice all Achilles set. Me nan's got these. He's taking the fucking piss now. This is not a Guardian supplement. This is real life. I have a real life sink problem. I've also got a real job I can be getting on with. Leave this helmet to finish what I'm paying him to do. Thanks for the brew. I'll get on with this. I should be done in ten minutes, then I'll be off. Okay. I'll be in the back room on my laptop. The next ten minutes I spent frantically researching Jessica Pratt on YouTube and Spotify. With a face that must display all the disappointments of a kid who's dropped a sausage roll in a puddle, I've concluded that she's good. Really fucking good. Just ordered two albums off the Piccadilly Record website. That's me done now. Do you want me to invoice you or... Fuck that, mate. Get out of my fucking house. Eh, no thanks. I'll pay now if that's okay. On the way back from collecting my wallet from the bedroom, there's a knock at the door. Why? I don't even ring people uninvited. It's a bit barbaric, this. Oh, I like your wallet. Harris Tweed, is it? I've got one like that myself. Of course you have. Of course you have. Yeah, I actually bought this one from the Outer Hebrides, though. I was on a course up there. I'll just get the door. I'm greeted with what could be an apparition. An elderly woman beckoning another elderly woman at the bottom of the path. Religious nutters, no doubt. Decent tactics from the Jesus firm. It's harder to slam the door on a pensioner. Things are getting freakier now. They're identical twins. Before they even utter a word, they've disarmed me. I've melted like a surly teenage boy who's had his threatening veneer removed by a family of pets that he initially didn't like because it didn't look hard enough. I even tipped the NME Walter Mitty on his way out. 
He gives our geriatric double act a slight nod of his head as he exits and trudges his way towards the van. I bet that prick's never heard of Kate Le Bon. I hope you don't mind us calling in unannounced. They probably lost these two or senile. Both, maybe. Who is it you're looking for, love? Are you lost? Oh, no. This is number 31, isn't it? It is, but I haven't lived here long, no. Are you looking for the woman that used to live here? Well, we're not looking for anyone, really. We used to live here. Can we come in? Ah, oh, I'm not into this, man. I feel a bit sorry for them. Um, yeah, follow me. The one who's doing all the talk and gestic gesticulates towards her sister. I motion for them to sit on the couch. And after an age, they eventually do. I'm not making any more brews or putting any music on. I can't act these two telling me about some new mystic songsters I'm yet to discover. Anyway, I'm Roy. Nothing. W what can I do for you? Jumping straight over the fence of small talk purgatory, the talker gets a point in. Not much, really. We're just visiting all our old homes before we die. Life moves around us, you see, not with us. I nod my head and simultaneously study their oblique facial features. They're waiting for a response. Well, when did you live here, then? From 1971 to 1981. Ah, right. Glam rock and disco, then? No. Punk. They would have been a bit old. I always thought punk was a young thing. I haven't even asked their names. Their air of weirdness has assured me not to. I bet you had those crazy Mohican heads, didn't you? They make eye contact with each other, and the one who is yet to speak just shakes her head. Do you want to have a quick look round, see if it's the same as when you left? It's a solid old place, this. Oh, man, I've gone full homes under the hammer here. What's going on? Yes, please, if you don't mind. We were hoping to. I watch meekly as they attempt to raise themselves off the couch. It takes decidedly longer than it did for them to sit down. The mute one keeps gesturing to her sister, who in turn keeps nodding and patting her on the arm. The silent sister then forces me to intensify my concentration. She speaks. It seems we occupy very different worlds within the same geographical space. Her muteness has surreptitiously transferred me. I'm now feeling like an unwanted guest in my own home, and they can sense it. What she means is, times are different now. Yeah, yeah, too right they are. The past will always be viewed through rainbow-tinted glasses if you're not fulfilled in the present. Oh, here we go. I should have trusted my instinct, the God Squad. I need to get rid of these weirdos pronto. The time-honoured classic of checking my watch doesn't seem to be working. You know... You have to live in dreams when you've got nothing. Oh, for fuck's sake, they're off. Tag teams up, taking it in turns to convert me. It's very important that you live the life you imagined. Love is not a neutral force. It's a power that prevents us reaching the junction of despair, annihilated and worthless. No, I've had enough of this. Look, I'm due in work soon. I'm going to have to start getting ready. I call that compassionate deception. It's not lying. Whatever it is, it works. They exchange glances and allow me to usher them out the hallway. Before we go, can we give you a hug? I'm not much of a hugger, really, but I'm up for anything that quickens their departure, so I'll make an exception. Yeah, go on, then. Then, go. Go on. Go on, then. On and on. On and on. Then on. On then, go then, then go. On, I've gone. I regain consciousness on the hallway floor, then swiftly investigate every room. The place has been blitzed. Jewelry, cash, car keys, laptop, gone. So has me bag of weed from on top of the fridge. A note has been left inside one of my all Achilles mugs. It reads, the most personal must also be universal. The cheeky owl cunts have robbed me. I'm demoralised here. Getting robbed's bad enough. But by these two ancient fuckers, come on. There's not a chance of me reporting this. 
It's almost as embarrassing as receiving musical advice from a plumber, a soya milk drinking plumber. He probably wasn't even a vegan, more likely lactose intolerant. Everyone's got to be something these days, haven't they? Yes, Roy. There's a great line at the end there about the personal and the universal. And I think that's something that you do really well. There's one great line in that whole story. <laughs> there are oh. several killer lines in there, Roy. But that one made me think about your ability to write stories that are rooted in personal experience, but also that transcend that personal experience by talking about something more universal, which is the human condition. And I guess what I'm asking you is these characters that you present with these hard exteriors and these vulnerable, fragile interiors, how do you know those characters? How are you able to do that so well? Uh, because I think because we're it's just we're all the fucking same really. We have di obviously different personalities and all that shit, but deep down underneath defenses that humans create, usually like character. Sh well, you know what I mean? When you could say a character defect, you know, is some a personality trait that isn't serving you well, but it's a character defense. You know, when we're defending ourselves with arguing or cynicism or... But once you move all that shit away, underneath all humans, we're just, we just want the same thing. We have the same fears, the same fucking... Ah, where am I going with this? I'm fucking... You know what I mean, don't you? That's, but yeah, I know exactly what you mean, and I think that's what that's kind of the thread that runs throughout all your pieces, that you have this incredible ability to present these kinds of... Okay. characters with these with these very sort of uh, vulnerable <coughs> interiors and also and also an incredible eye for detail and what I'm wondering is how what's your writing process where do those details come from are you constantly observing things and thinking oh that that would work well in a story um yeah how does that work there's, there's so many great lines in there that, yeah, I, I, I'm, um, I'm kind of like, I involuntarily just kind of takes, absorb stuff that lays dormant, you know what I mean? And I've got a good memory for stuff and detail. And then when I write, it just comes to life, really. I don't really have a plan or any, and I just sit down and write and see what happens. There's loads in there, and it, it only comes out once I start using my pen. I mean, you write a lot. You're one of those people who just writes a lot. Yeah, but if I write, if I sit and write for four hours, I might only get one A4 page. That's worthwhile. But off that one A4 page, I can go somewhere with it. So, yeah, it sounds ridiculous, but the best advice you can give to someone who wants to write is fucking write then. Don't sit there staring at a blank page. Don't look for things, but just fucking write. Um, like just write and see what happens. It doesn't even have to make sense, unconscious writing, but there might be something in there where you go, I'll have that. I'll have that. That'll do. Mm, good advice. Another thing that I've noticed that you do a lot is you tend to blur the line between reality and fiction. So when I first started watching you perform, I completely believed everything that you said. And I'm wondering whether that... Has been now, like, now you don't. I'm, that on what I'm on to you now. But has oh. that got you into any trouble? Because the things that, you know, the, the things that you, you, you come out with in your stories are pretty... Um, you know, yeah. print out there sometimes, and people, you know, I know people who, who, who do really believe that, for example, you were married to a Spice Girl or that you wasn't it? Dad. Yeah. It was one of the girls allowed. Do you know how stories change with yeah. yeah, has that got has that got you into any trouble? No, no, I don't. Sometimes, like after gigs, people come up and they want to they want to sometimes get a bit heavy with you and go, um, oh god. 
my brother's the same as, as your br- old brother. And I go, oh, no, it's just fiction, mate. Just a fucking laugh. I know, but my brother, they're pissed, like, and they're like, yeah, but I just go, oh, I need the bog man in me. I swerved them. <laughs> no, it's never got me into trouble. But I have wrote a few things and sometimes gone, fuck, man, that's really, really similar to Thingy, all that, who I know. If he ever reads this, he's going to think that's him. And it's genuinely not. Yeah, yeah. I guess we can't help but do that, can we, as writers? No. If, you know, we, we write, inevitably, we write about ourselves and people in our lives, don't yeah. we? Yeah. Or another. Who, what writers do you like? Who inspires you? Who uh, Were there books that you read when you, were, when you were a kid and you thought, I can do this? I am. Um... I don't I don't read that much. The only time I used to read, like prolifically, was when um was when I was skinting on the dole and bored and I'd like ten days till gyro day. And I'd go to the library and get the maximum number of books and think if, if I spend the next ten days reading these books, time will fly and I won't borrow any money and in and in ten days time I can just go and get fucking wellies. And then repeat the process two days later. That's, and and now I'm not on the dole anymore. I don't. I don't. <laughs> and that amount of time. I should basically. I should, but I just don't. Get back on the dole, or I might do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I fucking might not have a choice. All right. So what next for Roy? What next for Roy? Don't know. Um, Going to be working on some stuff at the Everyman. Two things at the Everyman, really. One is something I did last year, which was I wrote about Kirkdale, a short monologue about Kirkdale, and um, they want me to perform that, which is something I've never done, kind of on a theatre stage. I thought, fuck it, go for it. And another one is I'm going to be working on a play, um, kind of rewriting it slightly. It's a play called Squalor, and it's by... A fella called Paul Bertil, and we're going to bring. It got a run in London in um, the nineties, I think, but it's never had a. It's never been on stage in Liverpool, so there's a little crew of us, mainly the director Nick Bagnall, but he's drafted me in, and we'll, that'll be a nice experience. And then just loads of gigs, I think, when they open back up. Violet gigs have started again. Um, I'm doing some festivals just been offered one today some folk festival in Birmingham that like um, Richard Hawley's on it and so I thought fuck it I'll go just for that yeah basically you just go and do something and something comes of it and see what happens in it there's no there's still no plan there's still no plan yeah I have a feeling that there is a lot more to come from you Roy time's gone we're up that's flown by Roy, thank you so much for joining us. If anybody wants to buy Roy's book, you can find it um, on Rough Trade Books website or you can buy it directly from Roy himself. Find him on Twitter at BadWool9 and I'll put a link in the comments. Apologies for the um, slightly iffy beginning. Roy, thank you so much for joining us. What an absolute pleasure. Thanks, everybody. All right. See you later. Good night.